I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles now to Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 to 23. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 14 to 23. And I'll be reading to you through the English Standard Version. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as the days of her youth, as to the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land. And I will make you lay down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I'll say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words that you had written to the Israelites centuries ago. And Lord, now you speak to us again through these words. So, Lord God, we thank you for what you're about to say to us. And we ask you, Lord God, to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning we're looking at the second last name of God. We're looking at through this series on the names of God. And this is the name Ish. And we'll look in a moment what that term means. As a pastor, I've been a part of several wedding ceremonies, and it's always been a joy to officiate a couple's wedding, to spend that time in, in conversation with them, in marital counseling, preparing them for marriage. The important parts of the role of the husband and the role of the wife and how they're to work together, and then to perform the cer ceremonies with them a celebration of the communion of a husband and wife together. If you were going to YouTube, you probably would find a number of cases, though, where weddings always didn't go so well. Times where maybe the groom fainted or the best man fainted and fell over. And I don't know why it is. It's so more the men that f faint than it is the women for some reason. I'm not saying that women don't faint too, but for most of the cases, it seems to be men that faint. Nonetheless, Marriage is something that is important and is something to be celebrated when a husband and a wife have chosen in unity to be unified in Christ, to be in the bond in the bond and the the covenants of marriage together. It's important for us to understand that because it focuses this morning on a name of God, this name Ish. And it comes from this passage we have read this morning. From this book of Hosea, one of the minor prophets. And Hosea is actually an interesting book. Um, you may not know this, but Hosea was a prophet who actually asked Hosea, God asked Hosea to, to marry a woman who was an adulterous woman, who in essence was a prostitute. And it seems strange, doesn't it? Why would God ask a man to marry a prostitute? It's because God said, I have a lesson to teach Israel through your marriage. Israel often was a nation that was unfaithful to God, just like this prostitute ended up being unfaithful to Hosea. 
And later on, chapter 3 and on, his wife actually had left him and committed adultery again. But then he went as God had directed him, go again, call her to yourself. And this was a lesson too, of a reminder of Israel to come back to him. It's a reminder for us as the church too, to come back to him, to come back to God, to focus on him. So this name Ish is an important name this morning as we will learn and understand how God is our husband. We need to understand this name Ish because it is significant in how we view ourselves as the church, the bride of Christ. There's one main point this morning we're looking at, and that is this, that God is our husband. Now, I know for myself as a male, this sounds strange and weird, but it's still a good picture for us as the church. After all, in Revelation, it refers to the church as the bride of Christ. And so we as Christians, male and female, all who are part of the church, are his bride, and God is our husband. In our passage this morning, we see these words again. Therefore, before I will, behold, I will lure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And they will give, and I will give her, her, her vineyards, and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as the days of her youth, as at the time when she shall come out of the land of Israel, or and of the land of Egypt. And in that day, verse 16, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. God is saying here to Israel, a day is coming when you call me my husband. And these are a word for us as the church too, to remind us to call God our husband as the church. The word we find for husband here in verse 16 is the Hebrew, Hebrew word ish. And it means this. It means a man or, or a champion. In fact, a great man, but also a husband. It's very interesting that God would choose to use this name for himself in this passage here because of the mean of Ish. Not only does it just mean that he's a husband, but he's a great man, so he'd be a great husband, which also means he champions the cause of the church. Just like here in Hosea, God champions the case and cause of Israel. As again, we see in the Old Testament that there is still a covenant between God and Israel. Well, God has a covenant with the church too. And he has called us as his church, his bride. And we are to call him our husband. He is Ish, the husband of the church. He kind of gives us a little bit of a picture for us as men, doesn't it? Men, God has called us to an important role to care for our families, to care for our wives, for our children. God has called us as husbands to champion the, the cause and case for our wife and the children to become a great man. Now, I don't know how many of us think we're a great man. I don't think I'm a great man. Uh, there's a saying that says behind every great man is a great woman. And so maybe I'm a great man because I have a great woman behind me. But it's a reminder for us as husbands as we look at the character of God in this passage this morning that we too as husbands are to treat our wives with the respect and love that God intended us to treat. So husbands, and those of you who plan to be husbands in the future, pay attention closely to these words. Because as we look at God as who is our husband as the church, may we echo, may we follow his leading and his example of a husband and how we treat our wives and children. So again, God calls himself Ish, calls himself to be a husband, a great man, a champion for us. And this is significant here too because God says here in verse 16 again, and in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my ball. Now this is very significant. The reason why is because Baal was a general term that was used of, of those who would be worshipping a god. 
But the problem was, was other names were added onto the ball, like Ball Pure and other different balls that Israel actually committed adultery against God with. Where they weren't faithful to God as their husband, they started worshiping other gods. And so God was saying to them, there's going to be a day coming where you're going to call me your husband. You're no longer going to call me a ball. You're going to call, call me my husband. And again, this is significant because my ball, the, the name here is not a good name. It is, is a different name because it has to do with understanding that Baal wasn't the kind of example of a husband that God t- calls, of, calls us to understand him to be. But to use the name Baal, it's in a way more meaning of, of a lord or a master to have power over and to force into submission. And that's not God's picture at all. So God's picture here is, you're not going to call me Lord or Master in the sense of, of one who ca- forces someone into submission. And, and that, by the way, this is never a thing to force someone into submission, right? We should want to lead someone because they're a good leader. We should want to follow God because he's a good God, and he is a good God. But we're not to fo- God doesn't want us to call him my ball. He wants us to call him my husband. Because that more of a personal touch of a husband, the true loving husband, the one who champions the cause of his family, one who is a great man. So we have this understanding then that God is a great God. He is a champion for us. After all, again, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, championing the cause for us so that we might be saved from our sins. God has championed our cause, our cause for righteousness, the cause that he has given us. And he has showed his greatness and his kindness and his love and his forbearance for all of us. So rightly so that God would say, don't call me my ball anymore. Call me my husband. Because there's a sense of intimacy, the sense of great love and care the kind of love that we as husbands are to have for our wives. So God says in this passage too, here too, that I'm, I'm going to erase those names from their memory. They're not going to be no longer a name that's going to be uttered because they're going to realize that they can't be satisfied from anyone other than me who is their husband. I mentioned earlier that God refers to his church as his bride. And in Revelation 19.5 is that such verse that speaks to how we as a church are his bride. How someday he's going to call us home to heaven and there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the marriage of Jesus and his church to become fully one with him forever in heaven. What is your picture of a perfect husband? Maybe women, as you thought about before you met your husband, what would you like to have? What kind of characteristics would you want in your husband? You probably thought long and hard about those as what kind of man you wanted to marry. And for some of us men, some of us maybe thought about what kind of character do we want to be so we're the right kind of husband for God's best for us in a wife. But it's not just about the best wife for us, but for us to be the best husbands that we can be. I dare say that those are all characteristics that you're thinking of right now are important characteristics. If if money comes into that list there or career-wise, or what kind of career, um, you, you probably are looking at the wrong qualities. But if you're looking for if you looked for a husband who was going to be loving for you, who his eyes are only for you and not for other, another woman, who is willing to pay the bills and, and work to provide for his family, however that looks. You wanted someone who would care for you, who would show love to you in actions and words and deeds, maybe in gifts, maybe it's in time. 
Out of the way, it's a man who would have good godly character. And husbands, that is the kind of character we must strive to have too. To be an example of God. There are many people who have been turned off by the church because maybe their father was an example of Christ, even if they said they were a Christian. And that is a sad thing. So this is a reminder for us as husbands to be an example of Christ to our wives and an example of Christ to our children. There's a stat that says that that if children come to faith in Christ, that there's only, uh, I can't remember the exact stat, but it was less than 50% chance that the rest of the family come to Christ. There was a mother who came to Christ. It was about, uh, I think it was 46%. But it was, maybe it was 64. I can't remember now, right now. But either way, is around somewhere on the other side of 50%, more than, than a children's influence. But if it was the father who came to Christ, there's 96% chance there's the family would come to Christ as well. Isn't that a, an amazing stat? Husbands, fathers. We have the unique responsibility, the important responsibility that God has given us to influence our family for God. So again, as we see this example of God as Father, may we as husbands follow God's example. Here are some of the ways that God God showed his love to Israel and shows to the church and shows to us. First is this, is that God allures us. Now, that might be a word of discomfort for us right now because it's one of those romantic, um, passionate kind of terms to be allured by someone that we love or that loves us. But God uses this language to speak of the love he has for Israel, but also the love he has for us as his church. God allures us. He draws us to himself. And he does this in verse 15. He says to Israel, And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. God was going to give Israel their vineyards, the bountifulness that needed to be provided for, but also that he was going to turn the valley of Achor into a wonderful, beautiful place. Now, if you don't know about the valley of Achor, in, in this day and age when, when God gave his word to Hosea to write to Israel, there's a time where the valley of Achor was a barren land. It was, it was, a, it was like a desert land. But God was promising that he was going to turn that into fertile ground. He was going to allure Israel through his kindness, through his act of love towards them. God does that to us too. He allures us to himself because of his sacrifice on the cross. This great act of love he has shown towards us and continues to show to us as he provides for us, as he cares for us as he carries us through trials and tribulations, as he blesses us in many different ways, God allures us to himself. Next, God betrothes us in righteousness. What does this mean, betrothed? Well, betrothed is a very important term for the Israelites because it was a process, part of the marriage process. You might remember as we celebrated Christmas We looked at the story of Mary, and again, partly about how she's betrothed to Joseph. And and in the marriage ceremony, she was betrothed to her husband, but was not to move in and to live in with him yet. It was for about a period of about a year before they would move in together, while gave Joseph time to prepare their home for them as a family. But what does this term betrothal mean? Well, betrothal was, was a very important term that's focused on saying, basically, you're married, so you're not to look at another person, because this person now is your spouse, you just not have consummated the marriage yet, and you aren't living together yet. Kind of like an engagement, but they had even more depth of meaning and importance. My wife and I kind of treated our our engagement period kind of like that. We, We went through a courtship process together, and we found that that was important for us because we wanted to make sure that our relationship was about growing in depth 
and not just about dating. Yeah, we went on dates while we courted, but it was a commitment to each other saying that, okay, we believe that God has called us to get married together, and so we're not going to date. We're going to be courting each other. And so that's that's a little bit of an idea of what betrothal was like. It was a commitment to each other saying, okay, I've forsaken all, all others. My focus is on you and only you. And now from here till we get married, it's a time of preparation for us to get married, to continue to get to know each other, but also to prepare for a home for us together. So that's kind of the picture of betrothal. It's a commitment of saying we are getting married, but betrothal was actually the understanding that they were married, just not living together yet. So God betrothes Israel in this way. He betrothes us in righteousness. God says to Israel that I have betrothed you in righteousness. So God's saying to Israel, I've committed to you and to you only, but in righteousness. Great example for us as the church too, isn't it? God has betrothed us too as the church in righteousness. Through his death on the cross and his offer of salvation, when we come to faith in him, he then dresses us in his righteousness. Nothing that we can do on our, on our own is what God has done for us. Verse 19 again, it says, And I will betroth you to me forever. <laughs> Wonderful words there. He'll betroth us to him forever, not just for a period of time, but forever. He says this to Israel and speaks to us as the church as well in this way. Betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness. So God betroths us in righteousness. The term here, righteousness, again, means to be in right relationship with, with God. It, it, it connotes conformity to an ethical and moral standard that God has given to us. So when we are immoral, uh, we are not being faithful to God. When we break one of his Ten Commandments, his moral law for us. That's why God calls us, don't do this because you're married to me. You're my bride. Don't be like the one who commits adultery on their spouse. Be faithful to me. Live in the right moral standard I've given to you because that's that's what allows us to have a right relationship together. So God betroths us in righteousness. Also, God betroths us in justice. Verse 19 again. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice. Remember, God is a holy God. So not only does he call us to righteousness, but he betrothes us also in justice. And the word justice here is the Hebrew word mispat, which means right or privilege or, or even what is due. So God gives us the privilege of being his bride. But it has to do then still with being in right relationship with God part of his moral standard. You can't have justice without righteousness. And you can't have righteousness without justice. Because again, God is a holy God and he will perform justice. So we talked about that last week. God will perform his justice on all of mankind. So what side of his justice are you going to be? Part of the righteous or the unrighteous? Nonetheless, God betroths us in justice. Next, God betroths us in love. There's something we can't do with God's character. I remember some time ago thinking about, is, is God's prime character love or, or is it holiness? As I continued to study that a little bit further, I came to the conclusion that the answer is yes. God, but God, his main character is holiness and love. That's why God can, can be a holy God and can fulfill justice for of us breaking his law by dying on the cross for our sins and showing his love for us. He is holy because he is love, and he is love because he is holy. All of it is together. Fits together like a perfect glove. So God betrothes us in love. The Hebrew word for love here in verse 19, as he says here too, again, that he betrothes us in love. Steadfast love, by the way, not just any kind of love, a love that never fades, it continues. 
one of the sad things we see in our society that some people say that, well, I'll love you, and but they don't take that commitment seriously. It's it's more like till well till something better comes along, I'll be committed to you, or or until our love wanes, I'll be committed to you. That's not the picture of marriage God ever had for marriage. But steadfast love, love that doesn't fade, that keeps on going, that keeps on growing. And that's why husbands and wives need to continue to grow in their marriage together. So the love doesn't fade. So they remain faithful to each other. God betrothes us in love too. And God says, I love you. He has shown great love to us in the sacrifice for us, but also in how he continues to show his love and caring for us each day and each moment of every day. Next, God betrothes us in mercy. God is a merciful God. And again, he says here that he betrothes in mercy. We see how God has shown his great mercy to us, knowing that we can't save ourselves from our sins. He showed mercy by dying on the cross for us. So God then again has had compassion upon us, seeing our state, but doing something about it. That's mercy. God having compassion and then doing something about it. Wonderful, wonderful God we have who betrothed us in mercy too. Again, that's all part of his love for us. And lastly, he betrothes us in faithfulness. Verse 20 says, I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. He betroths us in faithfulness. If you want to see a picture of faithfulness, it's God. Because he has shown that he's faithful all the time. Even when we have been unfaithful to him, he has been faithful to us, pursuing us still. When we have been in sin, he has pursued us still in, in discipline, but to draw us back to himself through discipline. And then many other kindnesses that he's shown us still. And by the way, his discipline is kind because it draws us, it reminds us that we've done wrong against him and we need to come right in relationship with him again. God is faithful. He is faithful to draw us to himself. He is faithful to care for us, to meet our needs. One of the promises we see in his word, he says that he'll meet our every need. Whatever our need is, he'll provide for it. Is it a need for food or for a job? Is it a need for relationship? Whatever the, re- whatever the need is, God meets that need. Again, it shows his faithfulness to us. Like a good husband in God's word tells us that a, a good husband cares for a family by providing for them. God provides for us. So whether his provision is by a supernatural way or through providing a judge or uh, providing a job or providing other means, know that God is the one who cares for us, who's provided for us. God has betrothed himself to us. So we then as a church too need to betroth ourselves to God. In these ways he has betrothed himself, we need to betroth ourselves to him too. And as a church, yes, we're made up of individuals, but that's why as a church it's important for us to be together in unity. That when we see a brother or sister in Christ stumbling, that we come alongside them saying, hey, let's work through this sin together. Let's walk through it together. What if we as a church were to be in such a state too where we would, oh, where someone would be so comfortable with coming to us as a church and saying, you know, I'm sinning in this area. I, I know that it's wrong. I, I need help to overcome it. Help, church, help me overcome this. What a wonderful thing that would be. We as a church must come before God in holiness because he is a holy God. Because of the work he does in us to make us holy as we surrender to him. May we as a church, a church of individuals as we come together in community and in unity together, may we together surrender to God. To say to God, you are my husband. You're not my bell. You are my husband. And so, Lord God, we choose to be faithful to you. 
God is wooing you. Like a husband before they're married, like a man woos a woman, God woos us. He draws us to himself. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. He wants us as his church to be his bride, spotless before him on the day of judgment. On the day of the marriage lamb of the su- marriage supper of the lamb. Again, that's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So that we may receive his gift of salvation to be part of his body, the church, his bride. I want to encourage us to four points of action. Here they are this morning. First, let God draw you to himself by reading his word. Spend time in his word daily reading it. Allowing him to speak to you through it. Then let God draw you to himself by listening to him in prayer too. We need to read God's word and study it. Allow God to speak to us. But God will also speak to us in prayer. And when he speaks to us in prayer too, we always line up with his word. Thirdly, let God draw you to himself by being silent before him. Taking time to be in solitude and quietness before him. That's part of prayer too, being in solitude with him. Lastly, let God... Let God draw you to himself by practicing his presence. Remember that God is with you every moment of every day. There's a a book that I love to read by Brother Lawrence called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's something important for us to practice every day and every moment of every day. That's what brings us to the point that we can pray at any moment, whether it be verbally out loud or in our heart and our mind praying to God. We can be in prayer. As Paul says, pray continuously. We can pray continuously. Because we can remember to practice God's presence. To remember that he is there every moment of every day. So here's the challenge this morning. Let God catch you. Like a man who pursues a woman to be his wife, allow God to pursue you and to catch you. Let him catch you. If you're not a Christian, let him catch you by coming to faith in him, surrendering your life to him. If you're a Christian, allow God to catch you by spending time with him as we talked about already. Surrendering to him still even more as a Christian. Here's the encouragement though too. God wants to lure you into a relationship with him. God desires a relationship with you. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past doesn't matter who or how bad you think you are. God desires a relationship with you. He created you for that purpose. Do you want to have a close, loving relationship with God? Then let God love you. His love is the best love of all. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. We thank you, Lord God, that you are the perfect example of a husband, one that all of us as husbands need to mirror. But Lord God, may we never forget as your church that you are our husband. May we surrender to you. May we love you as you have loved us. So Lord Jesus, we pray, make us more like you so we can become the bride as your church, the bride that you want us to be. These things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.